have been really embarrassing to have an empty room, <laughs> except for the committee members. There's a few committee members. We have a WCSU school start time committee, and the members are Matt DeGroote, Chris McVeigh, Reuben Bennett, and Scott Thompson, and myself. And, and Oh, Allison Cornwall is now on the committee, too. So we are basically, and what happens if you miss the meeting, you get appointed chair. So what we have <laughs> outlined, our biggest thing, I hope you guys had time to look at the website. The WCSU website has uh, some of the materials. We wanted people to read articles and studies about adolescence and sleep. And we have a timeline because we tried to outline how we could engage the community and talk about the issue, get feedback, how does it relate to us. And I'll turn everything over to Bill to go from here. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, so there's some index cards, and those are really important because the committee's really committed to getting feedback back to folks. So if you could grab an index card, and we're going to do start with a little sharing here at the beginning, uh, just as we do in our restorative circles here at U32, our responsive classroom to elementary school. So um, I'm going to ask for one person to share. We're going to try to make a circle here so we don't have anyone's backs mm -hmm. to sell. So I'm thinking we're just. I'll have you just kind of push a little bit back. Sorry, I don't have, we'll get everyone's names in a minute here. Um, but just share who you are. Uh, you don't need to share your email, but that's the reason we want the email on the card so we can get you back the notes from this meeting. Um, and we'll talk more about the purpose in a little bit. Uh, what schools your children attend right now, and what brought you here? Okay. Anybody that would like to start to go first? And which direction would you like to go? Would you like to go to your right or your left? Uh, traditionally in board game, it goes to the left. So that's fine. So we <laughs> went right back there to the, the, the table right behind you. Um, my, uh, my name is David Lawrence. Um, my wife Sarah and I have twins uh, who are five-year-old and currently in their second year of pre-K at Rumney. And we'll be uh, starting kindergarten at Rumney next. And what brought me here is that I myself am a night owl <laughs> and would prefer that the children not have to be up so early. But in general, I'm also a big believer in the studies that show like, we're just push way too many things too early. Okay. So I'm going to use this as a pass around. So Orca, Orca's taping this for folks who aren't here tonight. And you guys can just use, is that going to be okay? You don't have to do that. Okay. So, all right. So, I mean, so we'll just go right over here to these two. Two kids, one in at E32 and one at Callis Elementary, and um, I just came to uh, learn more about the issue and where, where things stand. And um, I'm also interested in having a child at elementary and at uh, an upper you know, at E32 and an upper grade. Um, you know, obviously, there's different start times for them and kind of how that could potentially change dynamics of that. Hey, I'm Larry Gilbert. I live in East Montpelier. I've had three kids pass through these uh, these halls, come and gone, um, but I'm still very interested in the topic. I've read the science. I think it's pretty compelling, and I'm very interested in how resilient as a community we are to change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ann Gilbert. Yep, our three kids have gone through elementary school in this district in Midland High School, and. Um, so we don't have kids now, but I'm interested in what's happening with the schools. I'm also very concerned about substance abuse in um, Washington County and in uh, this district, and if there's anything about changing start times that would help decrease alcohol or um, other drug use, then I'm eager to hear about that. Hi, I'm Julie Bradshaw. I have one daughter at Callis Elementary in sixth grade, so she'll be here next year. Um, I'm just interested to know where things are at in terms of the decision-making process and 
um, I definitely lean towards um, a later start time and being aware of the research. I'm Callie Weller. <clears throat> I have two kids at Callis. I have a son in third grade and a daughter in sixth grade. She'll be moving here next year. Um, so they'll be at different start times as well. So I'm in that boat. Um, I'm also going to divulge that I teach at Callis Elementary School. <laughs> so it affects me a little bit in my job. I'm here um, just to get more information, find out what the thinking is currently um, and what other parents think. I'm Amy LePage, East Montpelier, and both of my kiddos will be here next year. Um, I'm, I've been really curious about this topic for a while now, and really glad to hear that there's um, the conversation. So I was eager to come and be a part of the conversation, and I was eager to have these guys be a part of the conversation just because we've been uh, exploring, you know, how do you become a part of the community and start to just have the possibility for change, even when it might be a lot. Um, and I am also intrigued in how technology plays a role in this conversation as well, knowing that more kids are on computers more and screens more because their homework is due that way, and also knowing that that means they're probably on their screens later. So how does that somehow tie in with this conversation as well and in terms of their mental health well-being because they are going to be exposed more and more to screen time and if they can get more sleep if that really means they get more sleep, I don't know, <laughs> the late start time, but. I'm Yvonne Quelch, and I have a son in freshman year here, and he is a special needs child. So changing the start and stop times are a major problem for us. My name is Jennifer Micah, and I have two students in the high school, and I am very much in support of the start time. I think it's been a long time coming, and I'm a strong opponent, and um, I think that there's a lot of research that supports it, and I think there's very little downside to it. I know that there are scheduling issues, but we all have scheduling issues, and I think that um, the well-being of our children really depends on, on some of this, and, and if we want to teach our children that science matters and that research matters, then I think we need to apply it. Karen mm -hmm. Stridesburg. My husband and I are alum of the school, as are our five kids. I've got a grandson at East Montpelier, and I now happen to be on the Berlin School Board. This conversation has been had before, a number of years ago. I'm always interested in anything that is going on in the community. It affects so many people. I'm not really for it or, or against it, but it affects all the students, all the teachers, all the families, some of the things in the community, daycares and other businesses and stuff. So I'm just really curious what everybody's going to say and how it's going to work out. Okay. Um, I'm Fred Lothar and I have a son at Callis Elementary. He's in fifth grade. And um, I am here because I really support the later start time. I think it's a great idea. I've read some of the research and it seems really good. I think it would be good for him. Uh, I'm Matthew DeGroat. I'm, I live in Worcester. I have, my oldest son is a junior at Montpelier High School, actually, which starts at 8. I have a freshman here at U32 and a fourth grader at Doty in Worcester. And um, it was kind of caring to introduce me as a member of the committee, but uh, I was just appointed. This is literally my first meeting, so I'm learning as much as uh, anyone that's here. Um, and I asked to be on this committee because I'm interested in basically how we use the school day. Are we using it to best effect? Are there different way, things that we can do maybe that would yield better outcomes or better opportunities for kids? So. Um, my name is Wendy Moore. I have a son in seventh grade at U32 and a daughter at sixth grade um, at Runney. Um, I'm here as a parent, a strong proponent for later start times. Um, I teach seventh and eighth grade science, so um, I see these adolescents every single day in my classroom coming in exhausted, um, and I see the effects um, on their learning and um, their moods. Um, and their development. Um, so it's not only my kids, but it's also, you know, I see it in my students. And um, just the amount of research that has come out in the past 20 years around sleep and how it affects 
every single function in our bodies, um, and particularly adolescence in brain development, um, um, physical, emotional, mental, um, and academic um, well-being um, are really affected by sleep. And so I'm hoping, I'm here hoping to find a way to balance all of this, um, these benefits with the needs of the community because I know there are a lot of questions around it and that this has come up before. And I'm hoping we can find a solution because it's so important. It's just really important, I think. Thanks. I'm Carl Whitkey, I'm from Worcester. I have two seniors here at U32 and an eighth grader. And I have a junior at Montpelier, uh, same, uh, same as Matthew. Um, I've been following this research for years. I think it's fascinating. And it, I've always been kind of like Larry. I'm fascinated in our community's resistance to change and, and that process. I'm really just here to support the committee's work. Um, I think it's important work. And I think, I think, I think following the, the, in, the research makes sense, mm -hmm. but you know the after-school activities becomes to, to my mind the that's the real challenge. Is can we can we fit the extracurriculars into our day in a constructive way at the same time as we set up our, our in-school learning time to be its best? Thanks. I'm Scott Thompson from Callis. I'm on the U32 board and on the committee as well. I have. Two kids here at U32 at the moment, one a 12th grader, the other a 9th grader. And uh, I'm actually really thrilled to see everyone here, um, both parents and former parents or people who don't have children at the school but who are still interested in what goes on here. I, I think it's really vitally important to everybody, not just to parents um, present and near future. Uh, I know this is really a hard thing. It, it's, um, it's a major undertaking and there are potential major adjustments that have to be made. Uh, I'm convinced that they're possible. They're all possible. And that thanks to your help getting here and trying to at least take a first cut at brainstorming through the uh, concerns, the possibilities that will really have a, um, a big impetus behind us to try to work all of the, these issues out and get somewhere really good. Um, hi, my name is Chris Bugay from the uh, from Middlesex, I serve on the Rumney board. Um, I have uh, children like Ann and Larry who are long gone from the school system, although I'm kind of having second pass throughs as my new wife, Sorsha Anderson, reminded me the other day, because she has a, a son named Ace who's in, in Rumney now. So uh, it is a very real uh, issue in, in our family. Um, I, I think the, the um, studies are pretty compelling in terms of benefits uh, for both um, uh, grammar school students and high school students. Um, but I do think the obstacles are a community reaction and um, really trying to figure out a way that um, the change that hopefully is going to come uh, will not be too hard an impact on members of our community and hopefully we'll be able to, to address or at least propose solutions that will um, help everyone in transition if the transition comes. Hi, my name is Allison Cornwall. I am also on the Rummy board and uh, on the, the start time committee. Um, I was interested in this issue. Well, I have young children, let's see, eight, soon to be seven, and soon to be four. Uh, so it doesn't quite apply to us yet. They all still like to get up very early. But as an undergraduate in college, uh, a good friend of mine worked for Dr. Dement, who is kind of the sleep doctor in the US. And he is a very odd man, but he's very endearing. He's very charming. And he actually would have these long philosophical discussions with students, like, well, maybe we're only here to sleep, like we're only awake so that we can have a life so that we can then sleep. And I always thought that that sounded insane until I had children when I quit sleeping entirely, at which point I realized just how important it is. Um, and for many of us who have young children who have literally gone for years without having the kind of sleep that we should, it, 
it's a powerful drive. So I thought there were some fantastic issues that I'm particularly interested in. Um, the relation to substance abuse I thought was a really fascinating one, especially as it applies to drugs that students take to help improve their performance. Mm -hmm. um, and also the screens, I think the screens are really an important thing as well. You know, what does it mean? I, I have trouble focusing late at night when I'm doing work. It's like, you know, even I have the temptation to go to Facebook and I don't even like Facebook. So what is this like <laughs> for children that have, you know, and I don't even know what they, Instagram, like I think that's a website. And um, so I think these are all really important, important topics. I'm particularly interested kind of at what Chris brought up at the mechanics of how this can work and very specifically what the specific mechanical objections are. And I, I think that they have to do with, um, when I was talking to Karen earlier about some families really rely on their older children for childcare in the afternoon. So I'm hoping that we can talk on that a bit to, to start to get a feel for what the specific obstacles are. And I'm gonna ask one last person, Ruben, I think is getting up to speed, but just we're gonna introduce each other. It's high. Hi. We're asking everyone to introduce themselves okay. and what might have brought you here. Okay. I'm Deborah Smaller and I'm a parent here. I have a senior and an eighth grader and very intrigued that the conversation is starting here. I was actually surprised that it's starting because places and people get entrenched in the way things have always been and so I was surprised to hear that there's conversation <laughs> going on about it. Great. So, Thanks. Yeah. So thank you all for sharing, and Deborah, if you can put out note cards, we're trying to get everyone's email so we can put everything together. We're, we're committing to within a week from tonight, we'll get notes from this meeting. You're going to create a lot of information for us tonight. You're our, this is the worker group. So um, the committee worked really hard uh, in two meetings to develop a process. Um, as you can see up there, tonight is really, we're going to do a little learning together. We're going to use a TED Talk video. And we're going to ask you to use a little bit of a protocol that we use in schools. Callie can help us because you're used to this one. I know you know it, Callie. Sorry, I had to. Um, that is really going to get away for you to have a discussion because as I heard the group talk about, we have many different levels of knowledge that are in the room. So we want to at least get us to a common ground that we can talk from and have this conversation. The purpose of tonight is really to learn together and kind of figure out what the issues are. There's a member of the committee at each table. We're probably going to go down to four tables, or maybe, we'll see, maybe we have the three of you move up front with these groups. And the idea is to have f four or five people at a table. There's a series of questions. We're going to give you a protocol, and you're going to discuss, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. You're going to give us some feedback back on the paper, on the chart paper, and the committee members there will help chart that on three questions after the protocol of discussing the TED Talk. It's about 10, 11 minutes. We're going to give you the transcript as well. So if you want to highlight it, we have highlighters around here. We have pens around here. You can do whatever you want to mark it up. But it's just a way to start the discussion about really learning together and what are the issues. That's the goal tonight. No more than that. Then on the 11th, we're coming back to brainstorm solutions without saying, yeah, but, or you can't do this because of the schedule. Or you know, think of the whatever's going to stop it. We're not going to try to stop the free throw, what could we possibly do? Get that together, then come back together on the 23rd, and then try to do a, what are our top three options? Kind of how we combine and put them together. And based on that, the committee is, that's what, um, in community involvement here, it's really we're using you as a resource to build the knowledge. And then we're gonna use a wider range with a survey, electronic survey will go out to people. And that survey we'll use to bring back and say, what do people think of the different questions that we have? Because we may not have the exact option. People may not be voting on the option. But like, hey, it's, we think we've heard child care is an issue. Is that really an issue? Or maybe it's not. You know, but we need to hear that from the community. Uh, and then on the 6th, this committee has been charged by the Washington Central Supervisory Union Board to give a report back, a progress report. The idea of their charge, and anyone's on the committee, if I misrepresent it, please correct me, um, is that we're looking for not the 1819 school year, but for the 1920. Because we figured to get all everything set, we wouldn't be able to go. Did I misrepresent anything there or anything anyone want to add? No, just that really this is, there's no set decision. 
or, or anything to decide. And I come, I'm a veterinarian, and so I'm always just going for the plan. You know, I, I want to know what medications, what tests, and I need to stop and, and, and look at the bigger picture and decide if something is, if this is something that is important and compelling enough to work out those details. And what are those details? You know, that you mentioned rethinking somebody did the whole school day. I think Matthew did. And that's also, on. Um, if you think about it, and we do get really entrenched. Um, I know my, when I grew up, the high schoolers started at 7.30 and the middle schoolers at 9. We went for, we had full eight-hour days, not short seven-hour days. It was just very different, different parts of the country within our little community. I remember gymnastics classes my kids couldn't take in elementary school because Montpelier got out at 3 and they started at 3.30 and mine got out at 3.30. So these are just like details we live with. What's going to give us the kids who use less substances, who have less depression, less suicide, healthier, perform better in school, in athletics, et cetera, et cetera, happier, healthier beings? So I'm so glad you all came. So I, yeah, go ahead, Karen. Well, I was just wondering if there is any kind of details that you guys have to share out with us as far as if anybody's looked at what the data has been for other schools who have made this change, or you know, is busing truly able to be flipped around? However, or has anybody thought about this course? I mean, are there some of those things that people have at least walked through? Some? Yes, yes. I will say that pretty much any time we start talking nuts and bolts, Bill's like, "Yep, yeah, we've got the busing study. We can do blah blah blah." Like, so there are solutions there. When you think of uh, sporting events, say there's a baseball game and the team needs to be an hour away. Would they be released early? I mean, these are us getting down in the weeds and solutions, which is where I go. But yes, and then as far as the data, some of the studies that we have on the website are the ones where schools who have made a shift. And now a lot of these schools are making a big shift. You know, they're kids who are getting at the bus stop at 6.30 and starting school at 7 or 7.30. So these, they're talking going, those kids like till 9. So they're making big shifts. But in the communities, they do, they, there's article after article, they see the sports teams perform better. They see better grades, less absenteeism, less illness, less depression, less, like all those things, those statistics do shift in the schools that made those major changes. So um, the, the, there's compelling data there. Mm -hmm. How many schools locally have done this? The closest I have found, Southern Vermont, was it Bennington, I think, that yeah. did it the most recently, and that was about five or six years ago? Yeah. And so I don't have their data. I can get going for that. I, I know South Burlington, they have a really hard time. Yeah, I, I'd have to look. I frankly haven't surveyed the high schools uh, for a little while on this. We thought one of the things we wanted to do, we could get into the, all the options and all the details. But we that's really. That's the next meeting. That's the next meeting. <laughs> so really here it's about like what are, what inf you're going to say, what are the issues? So if those are one of the important issues or something you need more information about, um, we're going to get that down on chart paper, and we're going to collect all that. So we can try to get that out ahead of time to all of you, and it helps us uh, helps us get that information. So you you have that information for the next time when we start talking about options. Larry. But, um, just one specific data point. Yeah. Um, at U32, start time is 8 a.m. Yes. And in the elementary dining schools, it's 9? It, it's 9. It's currently 8 and 9. And We're, we're, no, we're talking about district wide. District wide. Yeah, right now the transportation's linked together. It doesn't mean it has to be. It just that's the way it is. But we're talking about everything. So uh, I thought I'd turn that back on. So here's what we're going to do. Um, thank you. So the, you you have two pieces of paper in front of you. You have the transcript of this speech, of this TED talk. And you have what we use called, we call the four A's protocol. It's probably the one I go to the most. Um, and we're going to have you join, we'll probably make four tables, because I think with the people we have here, there's about 20 in the room, and so I'll give five of us. So I'm going to ask Carl and Scott for you to join a table, and for Larry and Ann to join a table, and we'll try to distribute it that way. Um, as you see it, there's some highlighters, there's some pens around here. We've got a big box of high, we've got a thing of highlighters. The, um, and there's some Sharpie chart paper that, yeah, you'll want something like that color. Um, you're more than welcome to use those. You can circle, you can do whatever you want on this paper. It's just a way of looking at it. 
what we want you to look for, there's, you're going to, the facilitators at the table, which are the committee members, are going to ask you to do this. They're going to ask you to look at this, and you're going to just do like a one minute share each. So if I'm mad at this table, I'm going to say, okay, so let's talk about what, what do we think this author, this, this, in this case, the speech, Wendy, I, I can't remember her last name right now. Um, what, what assumptions was she making when she gave this speech? What, what, what do you agree with that was said in the speech? These are all right there on that, on that protocol. What do you want to argue with? And what do you want to aspire to? OK? So those are the, and that's going to be a way to get you to start talking about it. And then after that, there are three questions that your facilitators will help you with. But it's basically. So after we talked about using the 4A protocols, what does this mean as we explore changing school tar start times? So what do you think, what does this mean to you? And we'll put that down on the chart paper. And they, your facilitators have all these questions right in front of them so they can help you with. What information do you, what other information do you need? Because we were just talking about some of that just now. And what questions do you still have? And what we're hoping to do is take all that, gather it, we'll report out to the whole group, and then we'll get that written up for hopefully a week from this Monday. We'll put it up on the, we'll send you an email saying here it is, as well as we'll put it up on the start, uh, school start time website. And uh, we're going to ask you, we'll talk about next steps after we do this. What questions do you have? I went pretty quickly there. You Callie. will be sending out information prior to the next meeting. Yep. I can't be here for the next meeting. Yep. I'd like to hear. Yep. Well, yeah, yeah. We're also going to ask you to help get more people here. Callie. I have a question about this. I just have a general question. Like, yep. So you had mentioned that this has been brought up before. How long ago was this visited? Like how, the, how the long? The latest information I have is 2008. 2006 to 2008, somewhere Did in there. Did anything transpire from that initial? Like, nope, it stopped. There, there's a survey that was done, uh, and the, the issue of daycare was a significant factor in, I think, not moving forward. Um, just because a lot of families relied on older kids to be home in time for to carry younger kids, and that just that was a a significant factor, I think, in not moving forward. But there was a, a district-wide survey um, that went out, and uh, you know, it was, there was a lot of people in favor of it. But again, there was just a, a, a significant amount of resistance based on family needs. So I have two small. Spe Any other questions before we watch this? I think a lot will come out of these discussions, and we're going to learn a lot tonight. There are two speakers over here. I've got them turned up. Hopefully, they won't be, uh, you'll all be able to hear them, or they won't be too loud. Okay? Brain development, particularly in the parts of the brain that are responsible for those high oh, order on. thinking I jumped ahead. Sorry about that. in the morning, pitch black outside. My 14-year-old son is fast asleep in his bed, sleeping the reckless, deep sleep of a teenager. I flip on the light and physically shake the poor boy awake, because I know that, like ripping off a Band-Aid, it's better to get it over with quickly. I have a friend who yells fire just to rouse her sleeping teen, and another who got so fed up that she had to dump cold water on her son's head just to get him out of bed. Sound brutal, but perhaps familiar? Every morning I ask myself, how can I, knowing what I know and doing what I do for a living, be doing this to my own son? You see, I'm a sleep researcher. <sighs> So I know far too much about sleep and the consequences of sleep loss. I know that I'm depriving my son of the sleep he desperately needs as a rapidly growing teenager. I also know that by waking him up hours before his natural biological clock tells him he's ready, I'm literally robbing him of his dreams, the type of sleep most associated with learning, memory consolidation, and emotional processing. 
but it's not just my kid that's being deprived of sleep. Sleep deprivation among American teenagers is an epidemic. Only about one in 10 gets the eight to 10 hours of sleep per night recommended by sleep scientists and pediatricians. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, phew, we're doing good, my kid's getting eight hours. Remember, eight hours is the minimum recommendation. You're barely passing. Eight hours is kind of like getting a C on your report card. There are many factors contributing to this epidemic, but a major factor preventing teens from getting the sleep they need is actually a matter of public policy, not hormones, social lives, or Snapchat. Across the country, many schools are starting around 7.30 a.m. or earlier, despite the fact that major medical organizations recommend that middle and high schools start no earlier than 8.30 a.m. These early start policies have a direct effect on how much, or really how little, sleep American teenagers are getting. They're also pitting teenagers and their parents in a fundamentally unwinnable fight against their own bodies. Around the time of puberty, teenagers experience a delay in their biological clock, which determines when we feel most awake and when we feel most sleepy. This is driven in part by a shift in the release of the hormone melatonin. Teenagers' bodies wait to start releasing melatonin until around 11 p.m., which is two hours later than what we see in adults or younger children. This means that waking a teenager up at 6 a.m. is the biological equivalent of waking an adult up at 4 a.m. Now, on the unfortunate days when I have to wake up at 4 a.m., I'm a zombie, functionally useless. I can't think straight. I'm irritable, and I probably shouldn't be driving a car. But this is how many American teenagers feel every single school day. In fact, many of the, shall we say, unpleasant characteristics that we chalk up to being a teenager, moodiness, irritability, laziness, depression, could be a product of chronic sleep deprivation. For many teens battling chronic sleep loss, their go-to strategy to compensate is consuming large quantities of caffeine in the form of dainty frappuccinos or energy drinks and shots. So essentially, we've got an entire population of tired but wired youth. Advocates of sleep-friendly start times know that adolescence is a period of dramatic brain development particularly in the parts of the brain that are responsible for those higher order thinking processes, including reasoning, problem solving, and good judgment. In other words, the very type of brain activity that's responsible for reining in those impulsive and often risky behaviors that are so characteristic of adolescence and that are so terrifying to us parents of teenagers. They know that like the rest of us, when teenagers don't get the sleep they need, their brains, their bodies, and behaviors suffer with both immediate and lasting effects. They can't concentrate. Their attention plummets. And many will even show behavioral signs that mimic ADHD. But the consequences of teen sleep loss go well beyond the classroom, sadly contributing to many of the mental health problems that skyrocket during adolescence including substance use, depression, and suicide. In our work with teens from LA Unified School District, we found that teens with sleep problems were 55% more likely to have used alcohol in the past month. In another study with over 30,000 high school students, they found that for each hour of lost sleep, there was a 38% increase in feeling sad or hopeless and a 58% increase in teen suicide attempts. And if that's not enough, teens who skip out on sleep are at increased risk for a host of physical health problems that plague our country, including obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. Then there's the risk of putting a sleep-deprived teen with a newly minted driver's license behind the wheel. Studies have shown that getting five hours or less of sleep per night 
is the equivalent of driving with a blood alcohol content above the legal limit. Advocates of sleep-friendly start times and researchers in this area have produced tremendous science showing the tremendous benefits of later start times. The findings are unequivocal. And as a sleep scientist, I rarely get to speak with that kind of certainty. Teens from districts with later start times get more sleep. To the naysayers who may think that if schools start later, teens will just stay up later. The truth is, their bedtimes stay the same, but their wake-up times get extended, resulting in more sleep. They're more likely to show up for school. School absences drop by 25% in one district, and they're less likely to drop out. Not surprisingly, they do better academically. So this has real implications for reducing the achievement gap. Standardized test scores in math and reading go up by two to three percentage points. That's as powerful as reducing class sizes by one third fewer students, or replacing a so-so teacher in the classroom with a truly outstanding one. Their mental and physical health improves, and even their families are happier. I mean, who wouldn't enjoy a little more pleasantness from our teens and a little less crankiness, crankiness. Even their communities are safer because car crash rates go down, a 70% reduction in one district. Now, given these tremendous benefits, you might think, well, this is a no-brainer, right? So why have we, as a society, failed to heed this call? Often the argument against later start times goes something like this. Why should we delay start times for teenagers? We need to toughen them up so they're ready for the real world. But that's like saying to the parent of a two-year-old, don't let Johnny nap or he won't be ready for kindergarten. <laughs> Delaying start times also presents many logistical challenges, not just for students and their families, but for communities as a whole. Updating bus routes, increased transportation costs, impact on sports, care before or after school. These are, are the same concerns that come up in district after district, time again around the country as school start times are debated. And they're legitimate concerns. But these are problems we have to work through. They are not valid excuses for failing to do the right thing for our children which is to start middle and high schools no earlier than 8.30 a.m. And in districts around the country, big and small, who have made this change, they found that these fears are often unfounded and far outweighed by the tremendous benefits for our student health and performance and our collective public safety. So tomorrow morning, when coincidentally, we get to set our clocks back by an hour. And you get that delicious extra hour of sleep. And the day seems a little longer and a little more full of hope. Think about the tremendous power of sleep. And think about what a gift it would be for our children to be able to wake up naturally in harmony with their own biology. Thank you so I think we have some natural tables here it looks like we've got groups all going um, it's about by the clock in the back there it's a uh, quarter of seven so we'll probably go to about quarter after seven or 20 after seven I'll watch how each group's doing and kind of see where you guys are at but go around share the four A's first and then we'll get to the three questions that we'll chart on each on a sheet of paper. Um, and then we'll come back and report out. Everyone clear? Okay. So maybe we can just go around. Um, I'll start with the subject. She definitely assumes that the research is correct. So if we're going to buy her talk to accept that she doesn't feel it, and these really are reasonable studies that were done well.
Uh, I can imagine a lot of ways that these would actually be very difficult to study to perform because most of them are in the data. Um, but I haven't actually. I don't, you know, I don't exactly know what she's citing. So. Yeah, I'm pleased because that was um, the second thing I wrote down was that, she, that this is a lot of the speech is really strongly predicated on the soundness of epidemiology, which works really well for infectious diseases, works really poorly for many other things. <laughs> and even though ultimately I agree, I am troubled when we talk about things in terms of relative risk. You tell me something's incre you know, increased the chances of something happening by 50 percent. That sounds like a lot. But if the chance was one in 10,000 to begin with, it's not really so much. I mean, this is not a risk that I'm going to adjust my lifestyle based on. So. So, I, I have some issues with epidemiology and use as a social so, um, I, I would just admit this to you on the same line. I think that she's so much more positive. Um, I mean, you know, especially on a long, wide range of things uh, yeah. like. Uh, obesity, yeah. diabetes, and things like that. I was a little bit more skeptical, skeptical. Uh, um, but just like improved performance, I think his measure of performance not so before. Um, so there's a it's right thing in terms of advocating to overreach, and I think end up harming. Well, and as we said, correlation is not causation, but that doesn't mean it is not disproves. Right. It's a starting point for more. Well, I think when you do the test, I learned a little bit about the layers of TED. Um, the TED X basically is like jury, and so everything that she says, like you could get each of those studies and read yourself and analyze, and to be on that stage, you're going to over simplify and state rather than you're not giving a PhD thesis where you're going to go blah, 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 and the methodology, but we could all go look for that. And maybe that's one of those other things. What else do we need? Well, we want you know, to, to dive into some of those, or some people want to study group some of those and say, because I agree with you, I'll read things, and I'll be like, so they got this effect from that cause? Couldn't it have been this, this, or this? And yeah, so. that that in combination, it just gives too much weight to one right. factor as opposed to saying it could be multiple factors. But it's not this doesn't have an impact as well. It yeah. just comes to my mind. Well, it is, but I mean, since even she said that, no. Um, any all assumptions that you wish like, I don't know what um, I think like she assumed in the beginning so that it, it's a problem yeah, yeah. for all kids or for all yes. parents yes. to so get their kids said, out of bed. So I'm just thinking um, that. I don't, yeah. think, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's everyone's experience, nor do I think it's everyone's parenting style to think it's their job to pour water on them and make sure that they're all safe. Yeah, I have a pretty big problem doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it was difficult. I don't think it's I think it's probably a preponderance, but it certainly wasn't me. I mean, I don't know. I wish I could tell Mark and I have. My children are already very different. When somebody makes a claim like that, I always like to hear a little more, a little more data. Yeah. The numbers look pretty yeah, and I think just similarly to that, just how you know, there's part of kids, teenagers' brains are hardwired to want to take lessons as well. So there's that element you know, that's coming in. There's lots of pieces. Yeah, and that every community is, is kind of a um, but with that, you know, the possibility that there could be creativity. So how, how much of those behaviors that they're talking about are sort of innate and not driven by sleep? Is that a reasonable? Yeah, and understand that. that yes, there is also that link. Right, how causal or how direct of a relationship is. Um, again, going back to the same thing, more, more data about that. 
and it's probably true within that research that if you, you know help with the sleep issue, that it probably will help with those other things. But yeah. Right. Like taking three months. Do you have anything that the assumption one is kind of a, a harder one to talk about? I think out of these four, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have anything to add or not, it's okay if you don't. You've been totally I don't think I do. Same thing we want to go around with. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think just broadly speaking, she, you know, she used the phrase the power of sleep, um, and then clearly others uh, would agree with, uh, with that. Um, yeah, our, what are limits that we all have to walk in the There are obvious benefits. It would be interesting to see some of the evidence behind that, too, but I think I can look at that. I mean, instinctually kind of understand uh, the importance of having a certain amount at least. Uh, and that's obviously important for our kids, too. Uh, I think that basic premise is, feels pretty sound. So sleep is powerful and a good baseline is important. Yeah. For as much as I, I think there is some really good science behind it, again, having five kids yes. Yes. <laughs> to go through, I mean, I'd like to think that I'm not the only family where somehow on weekends and during the summer, suddenly they're wide awake <laughs> early in the morning. Early in the morning. You know, yeah. and that even well, though my kids yeah. didn't have any early sports practices or early jobs, even if it's just during the summer, I certainly know a lot of people who have. I mean, so I just seem very aware that there are just so many things that I, well, I, mean, I feel like that, the balls up in the air. would be a seasonal thing, too? Like, wouldn't it be much, like, in the summertime, I think, or we shift with the light? Like, when it's light out in the morning, we're more, all of us are more apt to wake up with the light. And in the dead of winter, waking up at 6 a.m. is hard for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can move on. What do you um, just to keep the wheels turning? What do you agree with in what she said? Do you generally agree with what? Can I say another little problem that I want yeah. to finish yes. up before yeah. we're done? So my other problem is that now we shift the hours. We have three therapies a week. <laughs> and these, your therapists don't have a Monday through Friday, you know, eight to five schedule. So it's extremely difficult. And then you have to get the therapist whose specialty is what you're dealing with. So now I'm taking him out of school three days a week, and he's missing a part or a whole class. And now he's got to try to make that up. So we're just spinning our wheels, really. So you, so you really don't think that they would, they that there's any flexibility on the with the therapist? No, because <laughs> you've got therapists that some of them only work four days a week. Some of them only like he has pool therapy. They only do that on a certain day of the week. This is not something that's really easy. I mean, it's taken 14 years to get a schedule. But those schedules are based on the current school schedule yes. too. But you don't have therapists working. I mean, some get done at three. Some might get done at five. Some may get done at noon. But they may get done at three because of the schools? No. They have their own schedules. They make their own schedules. So it's based on what their hours are. Um, so it becomes a real issue for us. Brainstorming. You know, do we are we going to keep taking him out in the afternoon so that we can bring him in early so he can be tutored? I mean, this is just it, we're spinning our wheels. And I know I'm not the only special needs parent in the school who's probably going to have to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. Um, just noting as a yeah. as a general as a general category mm -hmm. that this has to be paid attention to mm -hmm. and taken taken seriously. Yeah. So um, on on a on a on a positive side as far as changing hours in Montpelier where they don't have to bus as many kids, 
they're all on a slightly earlier schedule where I've certainly noticed that a lot of places like North Branch Nature Center and things like that, they're really accommodating uh, dance classes and so forth. They're accommodating an earlier release time. So people in our district might be able to join in on some things that they haven't been able to or got pulled out of school early to do. I mean, like the elementary schools, if they were earlier. Yeah. 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 That it's hard to get him up out of bed, and another one who gets himself up at six fifteen every single day without any prompting or yeah. issue whatsoever. Um, so again, it's kind of maybe the, to, the evidence is compelling as opposed to unequivocal. Would be uh, uh, yeah, maybe uh, something. No. Well, and as a community conversation, that kind of personal anecdotal information, you're going to bump into people who feel, you know, who are like, yeah, well, for, you know, in my house it works this way. And really, you know, at the, at the school level, the community level, we need to be looking at the amalgamation of everybody's experience. We can't, we can't drive a process based on the, the outliers. You know. I know this is getting ahead of things because I know there is going to be surveys and whatnot, but I, I think that survey definitely should include um, you know, how, how much sleep do your kids get? You know, what are in the course of a week, what, you know, um, um, it would be nice to know whether there are, you know, if 50% of the people say, oh, my kids all get 10 hours of sleep, then, you know, well, um, maybe, maybe we take a different approach to if 5% say they get 10 hours of sleep. So. I can see it, though, in my classroom. Oh, I, I know, but I mean, I... They're not getting 10 hours of sleep. No, no, I, I, I absolutely agree, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think that to have the data yeah, the point data as, from, as, sure. a, as a... Because if we're going to go out and uh, propose changes, then we have to have... The community, some some local yeah. facts, not not just national facts behind it. To, yeah, to yeah well, and, it, so. you know, there's region. You know, we live in a dark, cold place six months out of the year. That's a lot different than living in Southern California, where your diurnal cycles are run by 70 degrees and sunny every day. One, one of the studies that was <laughs> that, that that was it's on the CSU website is from Minnesota. Yeah. So, um, and we have Bennington, which I just heard about tonight, which is you know interesting to go down and find out what's going on down there. They looked at a study in here where they actually looked at the cycles in our body and them. The way they came up with that was they scientists slept in caves where there was no difference in temperature, no difference in light. They were in caves away from wow. the light, and it's pro, it's in our brain, yeah. so it yeah. doesn't even make a difference in terms of. It was really interesting reading that. Was, mm. Yeah, how they come, how they find some of this research, and where, where some of this information comes from, and the, the studies that they did or the experiments they carried out. Fascinating. So just just stopping to say, it looks like you've done three already. So yeah, yeah. it's about where you should be around the time now. We're going to get to the fourth day. Your term is incredible. Uh, sure, we're all. Yeah, it is. Right on. All right, what do we uh, what do we aspire to? Oh, and uh, what does that really mean? Do we understand that question? Yeah, I don't. I think so. I get, I, here's how I interpret it. Maybe others can interpret it differently, but it's um, um, are there concepts or ideas or uh, arguments that we would like to pursue or put in place or um, act on, I guess, is, is For, I, I guess I'll give you an example, like, um, you know, they found that teens with districts with later start times get more sleep and it has these four or five positive effects. Yeah, I was thinking it's similar. Do we aspire to that? It's, a, it's a kind of a no-brainer problem. Oh, really? Because I would interpret it differently. I would just say, if you're going to aspire to something, I would say, I would say something like, because the scientific evidence is compelling or unequivocal or, you know, the weight of the scientific evidence shows that this would be a good thing to do, then the U32 school district wants to move forward and make this happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's what I would I right. think is yeah. going to come out of this. So. Something like so. the, uh, 
we, we, we believe the evidence, we want to do something about it. That's what we aspire to. <laughs> evidence overwhelmingly points, points to a best practice. Points, points to change. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, that's just me, I don't know. If you want to do number three and argue with me, that's, that's, that'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, it says here what parts of the text do you want to aspire to, I think. Yeah, supporting all of the benefits of the research and aspiring to that change. In our policy. But also, I think, finding a way to help the community move through that. Yeah, this is going to be a massive and needs to be a sophisticated public relations campaign yeah. to, to make this thing, a monster. to sell this. I really think it's important to look at the long-term benefits. Because mm -hmm. I think in the short term, it's going to be sticky and messy for people to figure that out. Yeah. But the long-term benefits. I think having healthier, having healthier habits and then like recognizing different parts of your life that might be different than other times. I think that's like yeah. really worthwhile. Yeah, because like you were saying, that, that she said in the video, know, how different we are as adults and young children, middle-aged children. It doesn't mean that we're making them not part of the workforce. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean by letting them stay. It might not even have any relationship to what they do. Their brain. Yeah, their brain, their their sleep cycle shifts from 11 to early, like 20s, and then it shifts back as an adult, too. Second configuration is the slide, so that um, everybody shifts an hour later. Everybody. Oh, so, so elementary also, and high school are the same yeah, time. Yeah, that's another strategy that yeah. other school districts have adopted. Them. Right. Yep. Um, and then uh, there's essentially what you were saying that Stephen had um, we sort of had mentioned was um, the flip plus uh, a reconfiguration of the school day, um, taking advantage of of um, you know, possibly lengthening it and allowing it to be segmented or, or reorganized so that you know um, academics, sort of enrichment activities, sports, everything would have a place during the school day. And with the idea, if I, I, I can speak for Stephen, but um, my understanding or at least my interpretation is that. That this would allow um, students who might otherwise not have access to right. some of these kinds of programs to be able to, right. and um, and it would also allow possibly the integration of certain outside school programs, like whether working or uh, I don't know, uh, sort of mentorships and, and things like that, for that to be you know, also. Um, Square tied in with what's going on in the school yep. during the school day. Yep. And is the technical center, is that district talking about a change at all? Because we're tied in with them. We're tied in with them, yeah. Um, at this point, no. But that's a great thing. So that's to, huge. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's all, no, not everybody the just the goes there for the whole day. They go no. part of the day and they go yeah, back. But it's something you have to look at as far yeah, as exactly. how, like, how would that potentially yeah, um, change? I guess it's, it's called a career center now. Yeah. Purpose to yeah. yeah. That and well, I would love to yeah. know more if there is is indeed whether it be South Pearl, Bennington, any other Vermont schools exactly, that have yeah. changed because it's great to hear TED talks that are happening wherever in our world, but to hear about Vermont mm -hmm. stories on how it's worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in order to make a huge issue like you said with the career center, with playing sports with other local teams. If we're the only ones that are going later, you got kids missing. 
Sunday school. Yeah. You've got well, they miss school those anyway. Are um, unique issues. Yeah. 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 I mean, every right. school that has changed their start time has, has done what we're doing now. Yeah. You know, and I. Which is great to talk to them to right. find out. Right. How did you, how did you work around exactly. that? Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, I'm not saying that they might not be happy that they did it, but just how did you make it happen? You know, what did you consider? There might be something that we're not even thinking of yet that we should. Yeah. Right. <laughs> To answer our People questions. People are excited so. by office yeah. supplies. I know. <laughs> 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 Gotta keep staples in business. <laughs> So, what does this mean as we explore changing the school start time? What does this mean? It's an awkward question. So, I think, I think this means that we agree that we should change the school start time. Yeah. That would probably be best for the kids if we did. I think what is the uh, define of this? Right. If you can. <laughs> With the unfortunate flip side, meaning that it might mean more sacrifices for the parents, again, depending on what the particular work situation is. So, that's I guess, to me, what does this mean as we explore changing the school start time? It really boils down to, do we agree on the principle? You know, the, the foundation that it's worth working toward a change. Because it would be better for the kids. Yeah. More sleep would be better. Yes. We can't guarantee that every kid's going to get more sleep. No. Every family is going to allow their kid to still be in bed that extra hour. Right. But we can create the conditions where it's right. more likely. Yeah. Or right, remove the expectation that they have to be something yeah. that would be <laughs> <laughs> when they have to be somewhere. These are fat markers. Mm. Yeah. Um, the second one is what information do folks need to have? This to me is the. I guess I'd like to learn from the districts that already do it, what their experience has been, and what yeah. their. Uh, hiccups have been. And personally, I'm open to hearing beyond just Vermont. Has, oh, yeah. right. has anybody else in New England done it? Right. Know? Presumably teenagers are similar, right? So, what a part of that similar, packet yeah. you have? Um, part of that packet you have of papers, there's one chunk that probably. Oh, I can tell you guys how to find it online. The after the doll one, this one. So this packet is uh, available from schoolstartlater.net, and they have um, some examples of communities who've done the changes. Um, the ones in Virginia, but so there, there's ability there. But again, that's stuff we need to put on the website. So I think so. This is information. Information we need. Right. What the information does district or and what okay. the community? Right. You know, people who aren't here, what information do they need? I'm, I'm actually, really curious to well, see if that issue that was a big deal a while ago still is because I have a hard time the believing the that, kids? that the older kids are really watching the young. It really depends on the age difference. I mean mine are two and a half years apart and my yeah, yeah my son's not watching my daughter. Yeah. I think it depends on He's doing his own thing and did, she's I thank goodness she knows got her head on straight. Should. So I think that information yeah. has two parts. Do, you know, do we need to convince them that this is a good thing to do, and or do we need to then talk about the logistics of how it can actually, can it happen in a way that's reasonable? Um, uh, I think we... So do community members disagree with this principle? Right. Well, and why? And why? Yeah. What, what information do they need to, right. to feel confident that this is the right thing to do? Because they're just yeah. color. Well, you, you have, no, go No, you had your hand up. Uh, I'm also curious about how it interacts with our neighboring schools because we mm-hmm. don't exist in isolation with regard to um, oh, like, like sports. It, that's sports one right. big one that I'm thinking of. So like if we go later and have a game at Hardwood, does right. that mean our team has to leave before the school day actually ended? Yeah, right yeah. now. Well, they do that now. I play, a lot of ways, if they travel, a they do that now. We loved when we had to leave <laughs> early to go to a competition it's or something like that. Right, but coming, but getting to school later right. and then still leaving at one or one yeah. right. to go to North Country but, or whatever. You know, but there's, but it's there's a short day. When uh, 
Kieran was playing yeah. lacrosse. They had the club team. And what they would do is they'd play on Saturdays, uh -huh. but they'd have like a jamboree where two or three teams would show up and they'd play each other. So okay. you didn't have yeah. to have games during the week. Right. You had them all on Saturday, yeah. which is a way of, of dealing with that. Because yeah. um, there's a will, there's a way for yeah, that kind right. of thing. That's you right. have the other team that you're going to play, you guys... Because, yeah, statewide, right, you can right. take teams all over the place and they don't. They have and as it is right now, there are definitely things like I know with the Montpelier district that a lot of things happen at 3.30 mm -hmm. and our kids can't get to them. Yeah. Because we're installed. We end at 3.30. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Despite the, late, the early start. Right. You're talking about for high school kids? Oh, no, high school no, or grammar about school? Elementary. Grammar school. Okay. Yeah, there's lots of gymnastics classes and dance classes and music classes that our elementary kids can't participate in. Because we're not in Because we're, we wouldn't be able to get So I think one of the things is that we would want information on is what op, what what are the obstacles that community members see right. to this? It's just, needs. you know, just, just to deal with that. And, uh, and also we have to, I mean, the vocational school, Barry Vocational mm -hmm. School, Controls everything because they have to. We have to Plus basically them. align you know what, align our calendar to that. You know, it's not like the everyone can go their own way. It has to have to. Do. Why? I don't know the structural. It's a, it's a statutory issue, and and I think Bill would be able to tell you that we have to align our calendar with the very vocation of Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is there a school board in charge of them, or is it? They yeah, liaison they, with them. Okay. The U32 board liaisons with them. But, right. but they're a separate entity, too. Bill, but it's also... We have to... Tell us just about the aligning our calendar with the vote tech. So we have to, by state statute, align our 175 days in common yeah. between the five regional the five supervisory unions that are in line with it. It's now called... Uh, Central Vermont Career Technical Center, but yeah. you, everyone still thinks of it as Barry Tech. Yeah. So does that mean they're taking the lead on that, or no, just a party no, for? No. The, what happens is the five superintendents get together in February, and we all hash it out. We we used to, and we just all said, okay, this is like <laughs> until we get do some good work out in the community because we all want to change it. Mm -hmm. We're not sure how to get the groundswell of community support to change the calendar. Because mm -hmm. we there there's isn't any of us that like it. But it's just how do we make it happen across five supervisory agencies. So it's basically all Washington County. Right. So does the, the vote, does the Barry um, vote center have a veto? No. No, okay. No, I mean that's it, it's really how we work as a as a five superintendents. We have a good agreement that this is and there's no one that says anyone does have a veto. All it says is in statute you must have a comment. Okay. And what time does that school day start? Or those Very classes tech? start? I want to say like nine, but I'm not sure, and I'd have to go research. So right it. now, kids come here, and then soon after, like about TA, 8, 15, they get on. About eight fifteen, eight twenty, right after TA, they jump on the bus to Barry Town. Okay. Yeah. So I've got to say nine. If that's so we want to know details. On but we can get that details. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know about yeah. that? We can get all that. Right. Yep. Yep. Not, you know, to get to sleep in, but then they'd be like, oh, but we end later, mm -hmm. you know. Those are clearly stakeholders. Yeah, they're yeah. very yeah. I mean, this would, so and, and the way that this is structured would be a really great thing. Like, I'm thinking for social studies class, you know, you guys are debating things. Like, just the structure of this, too, would be great for kids to be involved in on their own. Yeah. Okay, so a different bus schedule, possible child care needs, mm -hmm. kid voices, the after school like the activity. Yeah, the after school and extracurriculars yeah. is a perennial challenge. But it's interesting if you think about um, schools across the state are all so different. Mm -hmm. and, there's know, no continuity. No, and I went to a school where the same as you, we were uh, high schoolers and elementary all on the same bus, but our elementary kids got to school first, just the way it was designed. It was the and then, spoke. Uh, right, and right. then our um, our other kids got bused. They started later, but they got out earlier. It was really weird because then they picked us up on the way back. But they left early for sports. They just did. The last period of the day was designed in a way that kids could make that up, like an art class that was like open and you could do it at a different time, like a study hall time or study halls were at the end of the day, designed in a way that that's just the way I went to school. And kids had to leave an hour early because they just, we bust everywhere. You know, we were way up in the Northeast Kingdom. And um, so it can be done. I mean, that's how I grew up. Yeah, we left. We always, for sports events, had to leave school early because yeah. we lived way up north too and had to 
bus far. Right, <laughs> and the sports bus, I mean, even here today, the sports buses leave before the end of school. Yeah, they do. Okay. Yeah. And I have to wonder about, you know, the new PIs, right? There's this new idea of performance indicators, which mm-hmm. is not the same as grades, right? Which means that a kid can work on a performance indicator for a half a year and have it done, or can work beyond that because it takes them longer to get there. Um, that if that is really the design we're working towards, like, does it matter if a kid misses out for a few soccer games here and there because they're working at their own pace anyway on a PI? Or is there some um, PI that can be assigned to that activity? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think that's... Because I do you know, education is changing. Mm-hmm. Whatever, <laughs> Bill has been doing a lot of that sort of internal uh, reflection in, in terms of how education is driving is being delivered. Yeah. Um, um, you know, my my bias is that uh, you know, law and whatever. Um, you know, we do it in my office. We bring high school and, and continuing kids in. I think that's really important. And there's no way for them to get actual credit, right? But you get this sort of continuing community-based learning thing. It feels good, but it's, 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 it's not working for a graduation requirement. It's not a science course. It's not a this course, it's, you know, it doesn't really have any of those. So, so, this community based so the idea for this is really fine. is that it allows for more flexibility. Yeah. I mean, that's supposedly the idea behind right. performance right. indicators, is Absolutely. that kids will have more flexibility to learn in different ways. So if it means, you know, playing sports for one semester and then buckling down the next semester, right, or however the give and take happens, it's supposed to be flexible. Yeah. And who knows, maybe you get PE credit for doing something. Right. So um, you're, um, I'm taking a semester off of PE I mean, that's what to this do is um, supposed to be doing, a, do, a ninth grade class, and they let me do that because I'm doing sports and I know I'm getting the physical. So you've got that piece, which was not possible until pretty recently. Right. And I think it will slowly be able to change. I'm just curious if you have, you know, thoughts about this. Like, are you... Feeling positive about the possibility of it in the later start to it or no? Like, like, what are my opinions on it? Like, well, what do you think? Do you think it would be a good idea to start later or not really? I feel like it would, but it would also contradict with like everyone who's like it would like take away from the people who enjoy sports. Like it would make it so that they would, would be getting out later, which means it would be in the winter, like be skiing or like running in the dark. And, like you wouldn't be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in addition to this, we need to get rid of the whole like Daylight saving. Daylight saving. Perfect. You didn't want to bring in any politics, though. So <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's inevitable. It's like a day to be. What else should sorry. we? I've got one I want to just add because I think it's kind of on a different. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's going to mean. Um, it'd be another major issue for our communities to grapple with. In, and I'm kind of coming to this having worked on the Act 46 committee. And we've got, there's so much going on right now. I mean, Act 46 is probably the biggest one, but there, it feels like there's our Lots schools and our communities are, are stressed with change and initiatives. And, I'm not saying we shouldn't we actually address this because it's really important. But it's definitely a, I think a consideration. Or do we have the capacity to deal with another potentially major shift um, when we're already dealing with so much? I also think it's important, and I'll just put this out. It probably doesn't go anywhere on here, but when you get to the point of formulating some sort of survey, I think it should be a have to for the staff. Yeah. Like I think the staff should have to participate, whether it's done at a staff meeting 
appreciate just feeling some what they see in kids. I would put it's that huge. under info yeah. folks need. I think yeah. we want we want. I think it's we need feedback from staff. the staff and the students. I think yeah. it should be put into somewhere in their day where they do a little online survey because I have a feeling the one one died too because not many people. You know when you get a survey and you're like, oh, I got five million things to do. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, and then there's a certain voice that sends tends to come out when it's only a very small pool. So just making sure that it's a really big pool this time is important. I'd also be really interested to see, and maybe it's in the research that's posted, I didn't go through everything, but um, some of the science over time, mm -hmm. like decades time, I don't know how much of it exists, um, but I don't really, you know, when I was in high school, I think we started at 7.30. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't remember this even being an issue mm -hmm. or coming up at all. And, that's not good or bad, but um, I'm just I'm really curious. And, and that gets to what are the other factors? What else has changed? Technology, air culture, and so much um, has shifted over time. So I, I'd be really interested to see how science more temporarily changed. So I that probably a question. Just down here. Yeah. I feel like some of these are probably. Yeah, that may well be. <laughs> I also think. It's like the application of, of research to real life. At what point do you take the research and do something about it? Right. Well, and also this idea of like one argument is, oh, teens, we should be toughening them up to get them ready for the real world. There is so much of that that goes on in the world, and it's not right. They don't need to be toughened up. They're, you know, it's like just listen to them and let them have a voice. And you know, it's like we're not supposed to do this over imagine our teens. You know, to, imagine telling that to pregnant women before they have kids. But we're gonna make you get up early, <laughs> toughen you up because when you have a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. I know. <laughs> Every two hours. Right. Oh, Scott, you've got about a minute. I'm gonna ask you guys to talk about. You did go off script, which is fine. Let you do it. So what? What? What's your summary of what you're gonna have up? here. I kind of layered them just because I was running out of shoe wall space. Um, and I'm going to let the other three groups go first. And then... We'll see what we can bring so up. So you have a general discussion, and then you can add in. So actually, this is great. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for humoring me, everybody. We do have a minute left. Yes. Time enough for another There's shoot. something that didn't get captured? <laughs> mm. We're going to do a little, I, it's about a three minute summary from each table just to kind of get an idea of what the conversation was. Uh, three to five, actually I say three to five minutes, we've got enough time for that. And then we'll end with next steps and some what we call exit tickets here just to get some ideas of what we can do better every time we try to do one of these. We shall always say, hey, what, what, what worked for you? What can we do better? And what, did you, what was your takeaway from tonight's meeting? So I don't know if anyone's appointed someone to talk from their table. Uh, but I'm going to start over here with this table and maybe someone. And I'm going to hand you the mic so we can get recorded. OK, all right. Uh, no, no, well, yeah, maybe. Sure. Our, our table, I think it's safe to say that our table on the whole was, is uh, very persuaded that the evidence is compelling and uh, argues very strongly for, for change. Um, in terms of, and I forget what the first question was, what do we? <laughs> Assumptions. No, no, no. no, no. no. What does this even mean? What does it mean? mean? What does it mean? So that was the first thing that it means. It, we, we need to identify the logistical challenges and possible solutions. Um, we will need a massive and sophisticated public communication campaign, um, and that the, the dissatisfaction of some unknown number of people is probably unavoidable, whether we make a change or talk about change and then do nothing. There is, we're going to dissatisfy somebody. Um, the second question, uh, what information do we need? Uh, preferably case studies of where and how a change like this was successful. Um, and more specifics about outcomes and benefits. Um, specifically, sports and extracurricular, 
uh, timing, travel, you know, implications, et cetera. Um, possible solutions to child care problems. Um, how will this change affect people's lives and how do they perceive that it will change their, their lives? Not necessarily the same all the time. Um, we thought that we really need student voice in this process. Uh, what do they think? Is this possible? Or do they feel like it's important? Um, and then what is the effect on society as a whole? More of a, a longitudinal, you know, what are the benefits for society uh, more generally? And then last, um, what questions do we have? Is that the third? Yeah. Um, okay. yeah what, what questions, questions do we, we have? still have? Uh, can the TED talk, talk be linked to a public survey? <laughs> um, what is the what target time change are we talking about? Is it a half hour? Is it an hour? Um, do we know if there are scientists or advocacy groups who are arguing the other side of this question? Because if we start talking about a change and there are people who oppose it, uh, they will find any scientists and advocacy groups that are making those arguments. So we should anticipate that. And then what are the budgetary effects? Um, teacher contract, busing, uh, facilities, operation, et cetera. So that was it. And then what were the sticking points the last time around? Picking, can we? Oh, yeah. Can we Why have we looked at this issue before and, and not you know, succeeded in making a change? Um, you know, ex what exactly were the issues that stopped it from moving forward. Thank you. I hand this over to this group. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so here's our post-it, because it's like the coolest office supply ever. Um, and we, we said a lot of the same things. The, we agreed, we did agree that more sleep is better and potentially changing the expectation of when a school day starts for children there's at least the potential to get more sleep. The information is a lot of the same nuts and bolts, like what are the community needs, what are obstacles community members see, particularly people who are not in this room. And uh, th I will put my chair hat on. That is the challenge of any of these committee things is, as volunteers, is asking and asking and then um, getting people to come out. It's, it's a challenge, so I thank you all for coming. We want to know how it would interact with neighboring schools and school districts. The details about integrating with the Veterinary Career Center, which is our vocational program, and the surrounding communities. The, what other logistics nuts and bolts have to move around, like community connections, bus options, the day length for the teacher. And the questions, some good questions came up about like potentially, is there any better way to advertise our next forum? Is there any way to potentially have it at a different location? So we all cared very much about getting more people at the next meeting. and. More people who, who, there seems to be a lot of consensus in the room, people who don't necessarily agree and can bring up points that we may not have thought of. Great, thank you. I'm go back here to this table. <clears throat> Does anybody else want to talk about this? <laughs> yeah. So I can hold it for you. <laughs> uh, so uh, we had a lot of the same points. Um, the um, one of the logistics that was brought up that I had never considered was um, the sort of multiplier impact of daylight savings time and uh, shorter days, meaning that now sports teams are you know running at night, basically. Um, so um, it was definitely brought up that we want to get student input. We also want to get um, staff and faculty input um, in terms of what, what this change would mean and um, what that means to uh, the stakeholders. Um, questions about um, uh, the, how the um, PIs progress indicators um, and the sort of more flexible education pathways play into um, what some of these changing days might look like. Um, there, were, there were a bunch of questions around sort of the science and the sourcing of the science behind this. I think we all felt pretty comfortable that this woman's a sleep researcher, but um, she would spoken some sort of generalities that a few of the folks at the table were um, 
I wouldn't say uncomfortable with, but um, would like to see a little more specific uh, information uh, about uh, the science, specifically science for the younger kids as well. So we've talked, um, you know, she was talking really about the teenagers, but what does it look like for, for younger students and are there benefits or negatives to um, changing or inverting or whatever the start times? One of the questions that the group had is, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about inverting start times? Are we talking about unifying? Are we talking about moving them by a half hour, hour? Um, which I, I think that's one of the questions that we're exploring. Um, and um, uh, info on shared busing. Um, is there data about um, whether shared busing um, positively, negatively, impacts um, student outcomes and student experiences. Um, and then the questions, uh, want to make sure that um, we don't negatively impact any particular group of students, whether it be um, less advantaged students or folks who have special needs or just make sure that, that anything that we're talking about as a group um, has those, those stakeholders. Did I miss anything? Anything that we should add? Sounds like a good graph without even looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> so then to this table over here. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Our, our table went a little bit rogue <laughs> because um, not everyone can attend the next meeting. So we wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to, um, to register other concerns and thoughts that might not have fit immediately in the context of, of the questions. But all the same, I think we, uh, we were heading in, uh, not surprisingly, in very much the same direction. I think there, uh, even, even among uh, five people, there are you know, different views or different um, Emphases in our views on, you know, on, a, a, as to the science. I think generally we're convinced, but there was a request to show the data. I mean, it's one thing for someone, even someone highly qualified and credentialed, to say the evidence shows that blah blah blah. But let's see it then, and I think that's a fair request. Um, the other thing that is that that became very clear is that the details of this are really going to matter a lot. Uh, so, and in terms of scheduling, in terms of of how the how the day might turn out to be structured, in terms of everything, it's um, it's a it's a serious undertaking that we're entering into if we continue, which I hope we do, on this track. Um, in terms of other information, uh, besides the data, uh, just to second what I think was said somewhere before, uh, examples, other examples of where this happened, specifically in Vermont, if possible, a uh, case study of, say, Vermont schools that have, um, that have changed their start and stop times, and how they did it and how it went. Um, <clears throat> questions that we still have, um, there are a whole ton. Mm -hmm. And feel free to read them, <laughs> the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is where we kind of let it all hang out and just had a burst of, of um, creative thinking and worrying in terms of how this might all play out. So anyway, thanks. Thank you, Scott. Um, so tonight was the beginning of a conversation. And I'm going to turn this over to Karen for a bit here at the closing. But I just want to go back over the next steps. We're, um, one thing I wanted to show you that I think many of you may have seen, but if you haven't, on the Washington Central website, there's a page that goes off the top menu bar under resources that 
um, shows this cool start time. And some of you were asking for research and links. If you go over here to the school start time quick links, we've tried to put a lot up here about the studies. Um, we're, we've been looking at some work from, um, I mean, I think it's start school early, startschoollater.org or .net um, is a group we've been getting research from. Make sure I have the name right so I see yeah. a nod from Karen. Uh, I saw it. I saw it around yeah. here somewhere on that table. Yeah, and so there's a lot. There's a lot of links like this. You may see these two get flipped, but it's, it's the right page. Um, down below, you'll see minutes of tonight's meetings and previous meetings, any postings that we've had. So please use that. If you have questions, you can email myself or Karen. Um, we'd be glad to get them. But this is really the beginning of a conversation. And the idea is that even through this spring, it's the continuing of a conversation, gathering information. I really agree with Matthew. Um, it's a piece that this group came up with. This is a public, there's going to be a public campaign here. And I liked what this table said about how do we get other folks that are questioning this? It's going to help us be stronger. So uh, please, um, I, my big ask for next time, and I, I heard some other members of the committee saying this, bring a friend or two. And I really appreciated the student voice. I'm glad two students showed up tonight. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the committee had asked about that, and I said, that's something that I could go get through the school at the school time, too. Doesn't mean they can't be here. So if you want to bring kids, bring them. This is wide open. <laughs> right. One question about these meetings. Um, these meetings tend to happen in the evening on these days. Yeah. Some of us work in the evening. You know, Monday's a good time for me, Tuesday's not. Okay. Tuesday's not. <laughs> So I don't know, just if, if you want to get more people, you really might want to all, you know, have a 7 o'clock a.m. meeting for those that work later in the day. And, yeah, that, those are some great ideas. Yeah. Too, really. And so you're going <laughs> yeah, to, on the feed, there's a feedback sheet that's a, it's a 3 two, one sheet. It's like, what, what's your, what did you get out, what happened for you tonight? Okay. So we're asking for three phrases or bullet points. We're asking also, what are two things that really work for you? And what's one thing you'd want changed? And if you want to give us more than one thing you want to change, that's fine. It's just a pattern of an exit ticket that I developed. Um, we really want that information. We want to make this better. We really believe in bringing more people in on this conversation. I heard someone talk about locations, more varied locations. So those are all good things. Yeah, I mean, maybe each elementary school has a forum where even if you're a high school family, you still can show up at your elementary school and be part of the forum. I just uh, I think that if you're seriously thinking about making change, people need to know you're seriously thinking about making change because forums happen a lot. Yeah. And uh, um, everybody will kind of jump on a forum and then feel like, oh boy, it's not going anywhere. If we're really thinking this is going somewhere, then we need to pe tell people this is really going somewhere. If you really want to be a part of that conversation and how it affects you and your family, then you need to get here. Making it kind of a serious thing because I brought it up. You know, at our school, and there were people who were kind of like, e e is it going to go anywhere? <laughs> so if it's really going to go somewhere, you know, yeah. letting people know. Yeah. Allison. It's actually an excellent question. What is the specific process whereby we would do this? How would, who would vote on this in what, how would this happen? So the Washington, my understanding from where the charge is, and I was any board member to chime in, but transportation is a responsibility of the supervisory union and we coordinate our transportation. So I would see it as the as she, supervisory union board would be the one that would have the last. So the school board members who have voting on voting the supervisory union? Voting on the supervisory union, union board. Okay. There are 18 of them, and if people need that information, it's on the website. They'd be glad to get it to any of you and, and let you know what that is. But I, I believe it's going to be the, and that's and that may, there may be assumption by, by myself, but that's where I see it. So, Bill, I just, want to, I just want to point out for those that don't know, my understanding is that the committee is charged to report out to the SU board in, in June yeah. the findings of these forms and discussions and any recommendations if there are any at that point. So then I believe the SU board would take a would decide whether to give the committee a new charge or take another step or, you know, that's all open at this point. I'm just curious about the, the so if, this isn't really a transportation issue. This is a student health and so it sounds like it's a little more tail wagging the dog if you're putting it in the context of transportation. Yeah. I, I, it doesn't transportation follow from the decision that's made? It is, but the decision, it, it's, this is where we could get into a long discussion about governance in Vermont. Um, so I'm not really sure for my part 
you know, is it a local board decision? Is it the SU board decision? I'm not sure, and I think it, I think it's a, I think, and that's where I'm going into the transportation piece because of that piece of it. Um, but I think these boards have, have also with their alternative governance have said we're going to work together on, on right. issues. Yeah, and I don't think it would be, it wouldn't be driven by transportation. It would, I think it would be driven by what's best for kids and whether it makes sense. Um, and transportation would, would follow. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, there's some quirks in, in law that, you, you use a, an you know a vehicle to get a greater good, and that it may be this here, but right. but it's it's just more of a global. It's what's best for kids, not what's best for the bus company. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to give that impression. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the bus company, they, with the way our contracts written, they'll they'll move to where we want them to. Right. Yeah. 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 That's. Ruben, did you have something to add to that? Or? Well, I said quickly in this table, transportation was sort of my entry point into into this broader discussion. But this broader discussion, um, would a change would obviously ripple out to transportation. But this broader discussion really stands on its own, it, right? If if the school boards or school board as a whole collectively decides that this is a change that um, that would affect student outcomes for the positive um, and would be positive for our communities, then um, obviously then busing would change. But it's not being driven by busing in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know this table is asking for an info request on where is the data, how she was just kind of, this is an amazing book that just came out called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. and. This is where the data is. It's incredible. Um, you can see all of the studies, the experiments they did, but it's written in a way that it's you can't put it down. Like it's a really good. So you lose sleep. It makes you never want to get out of bed. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great book. I loved it, and um, it has all of the data you're looking for presented in a fascinating way. And it also talks about how the brain changes over our lives and how our sleep needs change over our lives. So those of you at that table were wondering about. You know, kids in elementary school versus adolescents as we age, what happens to the brain and how does that affect sleep or how does sleep affect our brain development? Fascinating. So okay. which I'm looking forward to, but the the data that I specifically would like is schools in Vermont that have done this, just okay. because yeah. I do feel having Vermont information is important. I agree. But can I, can I ask why? That the, why, like the because students there's in Vermont a lot of versus things. New Hampshire versus Maine versus New York State. I mean we're we're a region. Why are the Vermont well, maybe kids different? To me, it makes a difference that it's okay. something that's happening in our area. I mean, I, I would not listen to or be interested in stuff that happens in New England and all, but I think stuff that happens out in Los Angeles is different than what happens here in Vermont. Not that kids aren't the same, but I mean, our school systems are different. The opportunities that we have are different. Whether or not you have places that you can run to 24 hours a day are different. I Absolutely, but know? there are so many regions in our country that are similar to us. I can think of small towns in Wisconsin, Minnesota, similar climate, similar daylight, similar type things. So I just feel like we're raising citizens of the world and the whole country, and if we are myopic, and only care about that, I don't know that we're going to have as much data to pull from. But if we wanted to say kids who have similar community size, community um, daylight hours, I mean, someone mentioned, yeah. I think, you know, it, that would give you a little bit broader than. Well, that would be awesome, we're, but we're the second least populous state in the country. And things <laughs> sometimes work differently here, but even the, the time change stuff, not everywhere in the United States do they change do they do the it? clocks. And you know, my dad changes. in Indiana, that mm -hmm. it right. works differently there. In Florida, it, there's, their school years are also different. Mm -hmm. Right out where my dad is, schools start beginning of August and end the end of May. Yeah, and there's just a lot of differences. They have one week off in March instead of, of February and April. There are just so many differences. So that's why when I say Vermont, I know there's a lot of things that it's the same playing field. Right. Well, and in Vermont though, those breaks are not always. Like you said, the differences right. around the country so, are. So we can. We, I think they're both need for both. I agree with what Larry was saying. So look, we'll, we'll look for both. Okay. So there are some some exit tickets. We'd appreciate you do that. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We hope to see you. bring a friend back on April.